Greetings, mortals! Welcome to another session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell. I'm Diva, your judge, jury, executioner, and if you're thinking of summoning me, you'd better chuck the heavy metal and break out the Sondheim. Why do people still treat animation as being strictly for kids? It's not as if there are no examples to the contrary. From blockbusters with cross-generational appeal to primetime animated series to, well, almost everything that comes out of Japan, there is ample evidence that animated productions can be geared partially or exclusively to adults. Yet the message never entirely gets across. This may be due to the fact that mature animation, much like musicals themselves, went through a period where the genre as a whole couldn't find much mainstream success, resulting in a crop of cult films of varying obscurity and quality. Among them our next offender, Rock and Rule. A product of Nelvana Limited, yes, the people behind that Star Wars holiday special bit, Rock and Rule is the first English language animated feature produced entirely in Canada. You can't really do that in this case. A lot of effort was obviously put into making this movie and getting big name music acts for the soundtrack like Debbie Harry, Lou Reed, Iggy Pop, and Earth, Wind, and Fire? Wow, what was it with them in overblown rock musicals? Anyway, Rock and Rule went through more than the usual revisions and rewrites, during which its American distributors, United Artists, were bought out by MGM. The new management didn't like the movie, forcing more revisions, including recasting the voice of the male lead, after which they shelved the whole thing anyway. But it developed a devoted audience through late-night cable and bootleg videos, and was released on DVD by Unearthed Films in 2005. As with all cult movies, it has both ardent defenders and people who just stare at it sideways in confusion. Let's find out who the Court of Musical Hell sides with. As the credits roll, you can tell which side this movie's bread is buttered on. It's not often that the soundtrack gets top billing. And here comes that staple of bad 1980s fantasy, the establishing narration. Mock, a legendary super rocker, has retired to Old Town. There, his computers work at deciphering an ancient code, which would unlock a doorway between this world and another dimension. Right away, you're hitting me with one of my pet peeves. You can provide your establishing exposition via a narrator. In the land of Mordor, in the fires of Mount Doom, the Dark Lord Sauron forged in secret a master ring. Or you can do the text crawl thing. But when you do both at once, this is what I hear. Either this movie is so confusing we're throwing everything we can at you in a vain attempt to make sense of it, or we think that you, the audience, are too stupid to read this on your own. Possibly both. It's especially irritating when the exposition you provided is repeated by the characters in the opening scene. That one voice will bring me a powerful being from another dimension. Establishing information doesn't become any clearer the more you repeat it. It just becomes more unnecessary. So while our villain, Mock, lurks in the shadows and helpfully goes over his evil plan for the benefit of the audience, we're introduced to our literal band of protagonists, Omar the designated hero, Angel the more legitimate heroine, and Stretch and Dizzy the useless comic relief guys. They're about to perform at an open mic night, but are having some conflicts about the set list. So we play one song, one of your songs, of course. Of course. So if we did two songs, one could be mine. Ugh, before we go any further, I'm going to have to bring up sin number two, the animation. It's the reason why I've never been able to get into movies like Heavy Metal or a lot of the Bakshi canon. They're just so unattractive to look at. And I don't mean I'm expecting them to look like Disney, but even movies that are violent and nightmarishly surreal like Watership Down or grim and dystopian like Brazil can have an appealing visual style. Rock and Rule is drab, murky, and randomly weird, and the character designs are so off-putting. Omar looks like he got his nose stuck in a pool drain, Angel looks like Lindsay Lohan after the drugs, Mock looks like the mummified corpse of Angelina Jolie, and everyone else looks like vagrants from the bad side of Goof Troop. It's hard to get me to enjoy your movie when just watching it makes me feel sad and kind of nauseated. 
Omar promises to let Angel perform one of her songs in their set, but in between freaking out the poodle girl in the audience and threatening the literal rat of an MC, he's fully prepared to back out of that deal. But girlfriend isn't going to take that lying down. pitches a fit and leaves the stage, probably because Angel is much better at this than he is, and also because he's sin number three. Look, there's nothing wrong with having a tough, out-for-himself cynic who needs to shed his indifferent attitude as your protagonist. Some great characters have come out of that archetype. But you need to give the guy something that makes us like him right off the bat. He has a dark past, or a broken heart, or he's just so badass and awesome. Omar doesn't have any of these things. He's just a snide jerk who's always trying to be cool and copping an attitude without anything to back it up. If you can't care about him in spite of his flaws, why should you root for him to overcome those flaws? It's also hard to buy into his relationship with Angel. There just never seems to be a whole lot of affection there, and since they have so little screen time together, it's hard to establish any. Since their love is a huge factor in the climax, this ends up being a crippling liability. On the other hand, if Omar had his way and Angel didn't sing, the movie would have been over, so he does have that going for him. Yes, it turns out Mock's plot device ring identifies Angel's Debbie Harry-provided vocals as the final ingredient in a ritual that will summon a being from, I don't know, here or the demon dimensions, or wherever you think creatures with too many tentacles and teeth come from. So he has one of his goons interrupt Omar and Angel during makeup sex and invite them to Mock's place, where Omar instantly makes an ass of himself. Like I said, let's bottom line it, Mock. I'm not Mock! You're not? No. Sorry. Mock! This interminable routine is all a lead into Mock's big entrance, and... It kills me that I'm going to have to put this guy on the sin count because he's really the best character in the movie, freaky jagger lips notwithstanding. The build-up to his first appearance is good, he's wonderfully hammy, he's got Lou Reed and Iggy Pop providing the vocals for his songs, and he has a unique motivation. His popularity is waning, and he'd rather tear the world down than fade into obscurity. He's like the insane glamrock love child of the Master and Norma Desmond. So what's the problem with Mock? He does all the stupid things crazy megalomaniacal villains do in movies like this. The guy is the Helen Keller of genre blindness. Don't believe me? I will provide a separate count of rookie villain mistakes Mock makes over the course of the film. Let's begin with the scene where he lures Angel away to woo her while her bandmates are literally tripping balls. Don't talk to me. I'll show them power. I can do it with you, Angel. No wonder she's backing away with you going straight for the join me and we can rule the world together ranting. What if Mock had been more subtle and suave about the whole thing? What if he tried to manipulate Angel and the band into parting ways? We'll see later that he has the resources to do just that. It would have been more interesting, and it would have made the scenes near the end where he goes crazy balls a lot more effective. With trippy persuasion not getting the desired results, Mock knocks Angel out by attacking her with a tentacle rose, has his goons show the rest of the band the door, and prepares to make off with his prize to nuke York. You don't know how much I wish I'd misspoke that. Omar reacts to this development the way he does everything else by playing the too-cool-to-care card. Well, thank you, little Miss Ambition. <gasps> but the movie is still trying to convince us he secretly has tender feelings for Angel, so the trio steals a police car, which will never come up again, and takes a road trip montage to Nuke York. I swear, if I had a soul, part of it would be dying every time I said that. Meanwhile, in Mox High Rise overlooking Radioactive Music Hall... Okay, I'm warning you, movie, one more bad pun like that, and it's going on the sin count. Anyway, Angel tries to escape with the aid of the dumb mook's equally dumb sister, Cinderella. Which reminds me. Angel easily convinces Cindy that she's just Mock's latest squeeze and manages to sneak out with her for a night on the town. 
I've found the voice. I've got the girl. Understood. Although, to be fair, if you're about to summon a demon and conquer the world, that's a good time for some overacting. All mine for a song. And then nothing can stop me. Cliché, Mark. <laughs> See, even his computer is calling him out on this now. It turns out that the demon can be sent back from whence it came through the power of one voice, one song, and one heart. Mock, naturally, wants to know who possesses this ability. But who is it? No one. No one can send it back. No one? No such person. <laughs> This is why you mortals are too easy to trap into contracts. You never read the fine print. No one... No one can send it back. Could you be more specific? Uh... Well, when you say no one, does it mean there's literally no way anybody can stop me? Or do you mean that no one person can stop me, but multiple people can? Is there somebody going by the name of known who could stop me? Or perhaps me and my brother-in-law, no one. I mean, there's- Gotta go, bye. So while that's going on, Omar and his buddies managed to make it into, uh, Nuke York. Luckily for the good guys, Dizzy's aunt is the lady who gave Cindy her butt tattoo, so she tells them where to find her and hopefully figure out where Mock's keeping Angel. Luckily for the bad guys, the random dude who's getting his ink done just happens to be one of their informants, and he tips them off to the plan. Follow them, yes, but don't interfere. I have a much more amusing idea. Get me what's her face. Oh great, and now it's American Idiot. Everybody ends up at Club 666. Uh, not yet. It's not really a pun so much as a dude, look how satanic and metal we are thing. Well, it's described as a zero-gravity nightclub, but it's mostly an excuse for the animators to really go down the rabbit hole of Freaky. Where's this tattoo supposed to be anyway? Is it going to be on her arm? Or her leg? Or, or promiscuously anyway? And to push the see this is totally for adults thing by throwing in as much boobage as possible. Which is the actual sin number five. The movie tries too hard to be edgy. Just throwing a whole bunch of sex and violence into your story doesn't make it mature any more than a whole bunch of shit and fart references makes it funny. You can have sex and violence in your movie, sure, a lot of great movies do, but it has to serve some function beyond mere shock value. Otherwise, you're not really telling a mature story. You're coming off like dumb kids who are trying to act more grown up than they actually are. So the mooks pick off the good guys one by one, but not before Omar sees what looks like Angel cozying up to Mock. My dear... What's her face? Thank you for your help. It's a pleasure working with you, Mock. Now see, why didn't Mock do that earlier? Wouldn't that have been easier than going straight for the abduction and arm twisting? Mock manages to wrest some compliance out of Angel by pulling the old do-as-I-say-or-your-friends-get-it routine, after which he sends the boys back to Omtown, but not before he does something in order to fry their brains. Mock, change them back! No, no, I let them go for you. Omar! And you sing a little song for me. What purpose does letting Angel see her friends all messed up serve? For that matter, why trick Omar into thinking Angel was all up in Mock's business if he was just going to brainwash him or whatever anyway? I get the feeling Mock doesn't really have a plan here. He's just throwing a bunch of standard villain tropes against the wall and seeing what sticks. So the long-awaited concert-slash-summoning ritual takes place at Karna... Wait, they pronounce it Carnegie, but it's spelled... Oh call it. Like so many experiments, the ritual results in nothing but a big smoking mess everywhere. The electrical power supply in Nuke York is insufficient. I need more power? Affirmative. A sufficient stable energy source does exist in Ohm Town. Gee, thanks, exposition computer. Don't you think that's something you could have mentioned, oh, I don't know, before everybody left Ohm Town for this drawn-out side trip to the Big Awful? 
And don't tell me you didn't know. You worked out the musical summoning code and made a plot device ring to find the one person who could sing it and deciphered the semi-cryptic countermeasures. You could have easily figured out that you needed your 1.21 gigawatts of power to make the whole thing fly. You could have spared everyone, including the audience, a whole lot of trouble with one sentence. Still, the trip back does give Mock time to get his villain song in. My name is Mark and survive. I know you love the pain you got. You've never seen the likes of me. Why I'm the biggest thing since World War Three, girl. This is a good song, but its placement in the movie is bad. It should have come when Mock was trying to seduce Angel, or maybe as part of his big concert. Here it's just random. Oh, and one of the mooks, I think his name is Zip, is having a crisis of conscience brought on by the scariest children's show host I have ever seen. Zip, Zip, no Santa Claus, no Tooth Fairy, and no Uncle Mikey. Yeah, this will never come back to haunt Mock, I'm sure. And here we go, concert slash summoning, take two. Angel has been drugged into submission and is also half-naked in spread eagle bondage to give the furry fetishists their money's worth. The ritual ends up causing an enormous surge of power, which somehow snaps the good guys out of whatever was somehow done to their heads earlier. Omar, the only thing she cares about is being up there with him. You can't believe that. It's true. I saw them together. I've had it. Believe your heart, Omar, not your eyes. Don't you see? There you go, your one nod to character development for the evening. The trio steals another police car, which will never be mentioned again, and race to the rescue, but they're too late to prevent the summoning. This is so embarrassing. I used to date that guy. As the demon runs amok, Omar frees Angel and Zip sacrifices himself, saving them both because... Uh, the freaky nightmare clown made him do it, I guess? Which devastates his brother. I think his name is Toad. And Angel reasons, quite logically, that since her singing brought up the beast from the pit, it can push it back down. So Yes, it turns out that it's two voices and hearts singing as one that undoes the evil spell. Really, that's a crummy ritual if you can reverse it with simple harmony. And Mock has his pre-demise freakout. The day is saved thanks to the powers of love and rock and roll, Angel and Omar are big stars now and everybody thinks it was all part of the show. Even though a bunch of people went down the demon's hatch and eventually somebody's going to start asking questions about where the here mock went. But hey, they're singing the movie's best song so it's all good. In fact, I'm feeling generous, saving Grace for having the decency to end the movie on a literal strong note. I think Rock and Rule frustrates me because I like what it's trying to do. The music-based fantasy elements, the charismatic villain, and the songs all have their good points. But the animation is alienating, the story never really comes together, and it tends to be gruesome and dark for its own sake rather than for the benefit of the story. I can see why it has its fans, as it has a certain strange, cracked-out charm, but I felt like it could have been so much more. So the Court of Musical Hell orders... Well, punishments is too strong a word in this case. Let's call them remedial exercises for future improvement. In order to become a better hero, we require Omar to read How to Win Friends and Influence People. In order to become a better villain, we require Mock to study the Evil Overlord list. And finally, to learn how to make strange, surreal animation that's still visually appealing, we require the production staff to study the complete works of Hayao Miyazaki. So let it be recorded. This session of the Infernal Court in Musical Hell is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>